Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey, what's up, everybody? Hey there. Welcome to ATL and 29 of Peach Hoops podcast, where we look at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. Uh, although tonight we have to start in Canada as the Hawks <laughs> fell to the Raptors for the second time in a week. Uh, Glenn, I've, I've seen you a couple of times this week say, you know, if, if there's one more thing that the Hawks need going forward, it's an additional defender. What kind of defender? You know, I, I think it's someone who can replicate some amount of what DeAndre Hunter gives them. Um, uh, I I think I was forming this view ahead of this week, um, potentially. Um, but really what stood out to me as we approached the trade deadline uh, and as we watched this team play the last few nights was versus Phoenix, when the Hawks got into foul trouble, their defensive game plan basically went out the window. And if you notice kind of what they did in the first half versus the second half, the second half they really relied on switching to protect their wing defender hunter and it was similar to the way the team will go to a zone to protect their big man that's in foul trouble because uh, they didn't want to just put hunter on say booker you know the whole time he was on the court in the second half and ask him to not pick up you know uh fouls it's hard to defend at the level you want your elite um perimeter defenders to to uh play to play at and all that stuff so um, you know, and sometimes, Kevin, I think sometimes when the Hawks win or the team that we're kind of following win, you miss some things you can take away from that, even if they're kind of feedback loops where things need to get better, things need to be improved, the team needs to be stronger and such. But that was, to me, just kind of jumped out to me that it they really couldn't throw, a, you know, a real plus defender at Booker and at CP for as long as they needed to. And then when we watch the game tonight, I mean, I, I watch this Raptors team play probably more than any other non Hawks team, I think. Um, and if, if you've seen them play the heat like twice in the last couple of weeks, they go just relentlessly right at hero the whole game, the whole time he's on the court tonight, we saw that with Trey, right. Um, that they just kind of went right at Trey the whole time. And and I just felt like when I watched Trey on with Bogey, and he, even in this case uh, with Herter, that one more bigger, more physical defender um, uh, would have been, I think, helpful to try to, you know, force those jump shooters that made all these three-point shots tonight for Toronto, put the ball on the floor, step inside the three-point line, try to uh, create with their with the dribble um we you and i talked about the game earlier in the week where um they brought extra help down to van vliet in the paint but you want to force van vliet down down in the paint and in my mind you know you know i, I feel good about what herder can give them defensively but you probably don't want him to be your second guy who's taking that assignment the whole way first of all you need a a good bit of him from good bit from him on offense, uh, you know, and, and such. So, so I feel like there's an opportunity to kind of find someone who could slide in uh, and kind of take the minutes or take the role that Hunter gives them as a starter, 30 minutes a game or whatever, uh, at a minimum, you know, handle those responsibilities when Hunter is off. And then when you're going up against the Suns team that has CP and Booker and other teams like Brooklyn and other teams that throw multiple elite kind of guys at you, you might want Hunter and that guy have the option of playing those two guys together. So I just feel like as I've been watching this team this week and contemplating what might or might not have the trade deadline, um, you know, I, we, I think all teams are trying to consolidate and go get a, a, you know, top 12, 15 guy in the league where there's a possibility. It's next to impossible to generate that 
opportunity just just all on your own you have to kind of pounce when that's there but in terms of what i think might be realistic for them to do in the next week is go get a guy who can who could have for example tonight given them more chasing fred van vliet over all of those screens or um, putting uh, more ball pressure on to gary Trent jr who's you know been making a ton of shots but you know he's a pretty average ball handler for a guard you know ball pressure i think is the best way to affect his shooting you know and so that's that's what was kind of jumping out to me your thoughts well i guess mostly a question so when you say that you know the 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 issue sometimes for for hunter has been he gets in foul trouble and so you need somebody to come in and sort of be the lead defender at the point of attack when he's in foul trouble are are you looking for somebody who's kind of like an emergency guy like like when they had solomon hill or, or are we talking about somebody who you want in the rotation because i feel like if you go and make a trade for somebody who's going to be in the rotation you got to take somebody out of the rotation yeah, how, so, how's, how's that going to work? Like, you do you, you do you want another wing? Are you taking out a wing? Are you taking out uh, a guard? Like, how is this going to work? So, in my mind, I think as you prepare to play the best teams, this person's going to play a, a quite could play quite a lot. Now, do you take five to six minutes from Herder, six to seven minutes from Bogey? You know, when their defense is not enough to throw at, say a Paul George type or a Devin Booker type or, you know, a James Harden type or, or, you know, or what have you of those things. So I, for me, it's, it's sort of like when I look at the center position with Capella and Kongwu, you know, on Twitter every day, there's a fight over which one's better, which one the Hawks should keep and which one the Hawks should move out. And that's just a ridiculous conversation because they're better when you have both. I view this, what I'd like to see happen at the wing position to be similar to where, uh, it's a little different than the bigs because I, in this case, you could play both of them together. This second wing, you could play this person 30 minutes a game. If you just need to throw Hunter and this person say at Hunter at a Harden and KD, you know, or Ky- and throw Kyrie in there, if, that, if that's the matchup um, and such. So I think it's a person who can scale up as needed, but if some nights it's just that 12 to 15 minutes when he's, when Hunter's off the court, that's fine too. So the, I'm thinking of a person kind of, kind of in there. I think Nate would need to get to playing 10 guys regularly. It'd be more judicious with like lose minutes uh, to kind of open up some time in the rotation. Uh, and such. there are, there are times when Lou is helpful having that second really experienced ball handler on there with Trey. Um, but when I look at kind of what's the area where the Hawks really need to move the needle, it's that point, but that the point about defense has been, the area biggest struggle all year long. And, and I think just the, um, what I saw even in just the last two games has, I think brought that into um, uh, kind of into perspective, even more so than for me, than it was before these last two games. So if you do that, you know, do you feel like you can live with bogey DeLon Wright, and whoever this new person is, a sort of a three-person perimeter, is that going to give you enough creation if you do that? Have you have you seen enough from Bogey, sort of you know setting teammates up in that role? I mean, he he looks good to me in the sense that I think physically, uh, you know, I think he's looked almost as good as he's looked all season. He he's got some pep in his step. You can kind of see that when things are going right. You know, when he's running back down the floor, he's almost like high stepping a little bit with his knees up like a drum major, like, okay, <laughs> you know, right. you, you probably don't do that if you're if your knees dragging on you. So I mean, I, I think he's looks sort of he doesn't look, you know, he doesn't look explosive, but he looks very strong and sturdy. And you know, he, he's getting good power towards the rim once he gets going. Yeah, and he looks confident in, in everything he's doing offensively, which is I think is what what speaks the most to me about um in terms of being indicative of how he, he's feeling is he's, he's attacking on drives. He's going to the rim and not, you know, shying away from contact, which is great and all that. So, you know, they're, they're the number two office in the league. They have been that for a while. Uh, we know what happens to offense when Trey goes off, but I think that, um, you know, with all of knock on wood, all the wings back, when you can get Herder and Bogey kind of both mixed into the second unit, 
um, as much as kind of you need to uh, and such. And in the good gala we've gotten, or the in the younger looking gala we've gotten, makes a big difference uh, as well. So I mean, like any team's going to have some dependency on you know key guys playing on the bench to kind of keep the offense um, productive in those bench minutes. That that's not unlike what any other team is dealing with, really. You know. So it is going to, they do need a lot from Gallo. They do need to, to find a way to uh, adjust the rotation and get enough of Herder and Bogey in that mix. I recall last year when Herder and Bogey were starting in the playoffs, they were, they had great chemistry, you know? And so if you can get some of that pairing um, on the second unit, um, then that, in my mind, that helps as well. Um, so I, I think there's space for that defensive player. I, I think he, this person needs to have enough offensive value that you can play him, scale him up, you know, to that like 30 minute role and be on the court with Hunter when you need. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I loved when they acquired Clint what, was that if you close without Clint, Clint's going to give you no drama, you know, and, and, you know, if Congo is the right guy, he's such a team guy. And I, and I would hope that from a kind of a person standpoint, this is a guy who would be like, Hey, if I only get 10 minutes tonight, if that's what the Mets, the, 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 the matchup call for, I'm good. You know, we're good. Uh, oh, we're going up against CP and book tonight. I'm going to have to play 32 minutes and, and really kind of be on the court a lot against Booker. Um, so we can shift Hunter over to CP, for example. I'm in, you know, and that sort of thing. So it, it ideally be for me, be a guy who can kind of scale up and down speed. Is there anybody you have in mind? Is this, this doesn't seem like <laughs> if you're looking at teams that aren't really contending, it's a pretty finite list. It's it is a pretty short list. Uh, it's a tough list. I mean, a person asked me that on Twitter, and just a few people that came to mind, and and um, a, a couple of these names I have to say really only work if Hunter can work as your kind of de facto point guard defender, right? Because not every, a lot of these guys really can't slide over, but. I think Justin Holiday gives them something they don't have right now. He's not going to give you the strength, like to, to defend like a you know a power wing, like a, a LeBron or even um, a Harden, who's really physical, you know, in in, in his game. Uh, Kenrich Williams, I know, is getting a lot of buzz on like the podcasts and that are going around, and he is, I think, a a, a guy. He's that more like, like solo, like more of a bigger, you know, you can play right. more of the four, not really a point of attack guy. Uh, I mean, I think against the bigger wings, right? You know, the bigger right, wings. right. But that's why I said a few of these names really will, would rely okay. on Thunder playing sort of as point guard defender because Kenrich can't do that. Justin Holiday, some point guards, you know, sometime on point guards, maybe, you know, um, yeah, you know, someone asked me about, uh, you know, Gary Harris. That that's the salary matching would be tough, you know, there. Um, I'm always curious, like, what are, what is Oklahoma City really doing with Lou Dort? You know, is that, you know, and that someone that gives you kind of a lot of athleticism um, there. And uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one name that I threw out there. Uh, someone else that might, uh, I mean, another name that's been coming up on podcasts and such is, you know, Dorian Finney Smith would be kind of the ideal, right? That seems yeah, but <laughs> pretty far fetched. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Pretty, pretty. I, I don't know why they also come off of him except unless they're just like really afraid of um him hitting restrictive free agency at the end right. of the season, you know. Um, and so um, and then you know, I don't know what I mean, Boston seems maybe potentially want to move Josh Richardson, you know, I don't know what it would take to get him, and I don't know if um boston how they feel about kind of another quote rising power in the east if they'd want to do business with them you know or right. not and then the, then the one that we've talked everyone's talked to death is ben simmons which seems like it's not really going to be a thing for the hawks unless something surprising happens so that's the list that i came up with um you know uh i, I honestly i would need to kind of check in on the pistons to see if like hamadou diallo is i don't i honestly don't know where he is right this moment in terms of um if he's continued to grow as a defender or not it's i think it's hard i've seen some pistons games but it's hard to evaluate a guy like him in the context of what the pistons are doing on the court right now but he's, he's another guy that's kind of interesting is a guy that when he was younger in Oklahoma City was you know a better team with CP and Schroeder and Gallo and all that sort of stuff that he 
was competent there as a young, you know, athletic guy. So, but I, I honestly don't know if he's a guy who could kind of help a team that's trying to really p- make a push into the, the season, but he comes to mind too. And that's about, that's about all I got. Okay. Uh, uh... <laughs> you... Toronto is a weird oh, team. Oh, there was one more. Sorry. Tory Craig oh. is a guy. We're on a reasonable contract that I thought that I knew I was. I've lost track of where he is. Where he was, he's, he's been in, through Phoenix and Milwaukee. Where is he now? He's in Indiana now. He's in Indiana now. Yeah, I guess I I knew that, but he's just he's gone many places quite quickly. And yeah, and and he's a guy too that you know the way that in Indiana typically defends with both Sabonis and Turner and all of that you know, size at the four and the five makes it a little hard to evaluate him. He's had a couple of injuries that may have eroded his um, lateral movement. And, and so I'm just, I just, I like to say that like the guy he was two years ago, sign me up right now. Let's go, you know, right. His shot, his shot, his shooting comes and goes like a lot of guys of his profile. It, it, it's that's the case. Um, but, I, but I, I honestly would need to probably go back and watch, you know, really watch like three or four games, uh, you know, a recent games of his to really get a, kind of read for where he is but the idea of him and what he will if, if he has mostly recovered from these recent injuries then i think he might be someone uh you know but both he and holiday are in that kind of six million dollar range which is you know pretty workable you know in terms of salary matching and all, and all that yeah. sort of stuff where if we're talking about gary harris who's pushing 20 million you got to probably get a third team involved to find some way to you know, everybody, Cleveland's just holding on to that Rubio expiring contract to get in the mix and kind of get something of value for it for someone who needs like a Gary Harris or something like that. But, but yeah, the, the, I knew I was reading someone and Tory Craig is someone that I think would, I'd find interesting as well. And uh, our friend, Andrew Kelly, I keep, he, he, who's the guy in Houston? Jay Sean Tate. Yeah. Uh, really strong defender. Uh, I, I worry about his offensive playability. To be honest, uh, I, I don't know that he'd give you enough on offense to keep him on the court, um, you know, for longer stretches. Um, um, but yeah, you, know, you never know. He, if he's a guy who you get for a second round pick, bring him in and say bump, say TLC off the roster, uh, not to be just completely heartless TLC or Kevin Knox or whatever, then it might be worth bringing him in and see what you have. But I don't think uh, he gives you the two way play automatically um that say craig has shown you the ability to make some shots and justin holiday definitely can make some shots and and you know some of the rest have some some profile there um uh, tate plays as hard as any player in the league and he's just who does you know, jason tate plays really hard oh, oh tate gotcha right, right right plays really hard and you love just you kind of enjoy that aspect of his game but with what needs to go around trey I, I i'd be a little concerned on that end but um, hey, if they can get him for like a second, second round pick and, you know, kind of a, a really low cost uh, kind of add him to the mix kind of guy, I don't, I don't see why you just automatically, you know, say no to that. So anyway, there you go. Uh, I think I like Holiday best out of that list, but yeah. it, it kind of makes sense, you know, with the contract and with Indiana situation and what they're asking. You, you can kind of see that happening. Like that's not, too far fetched. Yeah, I like it too. And he's he's a sm- he's a good team player. He's a smart, good team defender, not just a good on ball defender. And you right. know, he, he knows how to use his length. And um, you can. He doesn't need to have a ton of opportunities on offense to be happy and engaged and activated. And which is, I think, important when you're building around Trey. What do you make of Toronto? You you said you wanted to talk about Toronto and what they do and whether you think it can work in the playoffs. And, you know, we've, we've seen them twice this week. More than that, even, you know, I, I know I've watched some of the tilts with Miami and Toronto because that's such a interesting matchup. But uh, sure. yeah, do you think I, what they're doing is, is sustainable? I, I think it's a – so I've kind of wrestled with that. I, I, I'd actually spent some time making some notes, uh, mental notes, and then and making a you know capturing a few of them on paper. I was like asking myself, can is what they're doing is that going to be enough for them to make any sort of noise in the postseason, or is this just kind of a 
a foundational thing for them to start to build over the next say two three four years you know from because that's a young core that they have there you know pretty much um and, and the one thing that jumps out to me is like typically you say to yourself well a team that's so reliant on jump shots and a team that doesn't generate easy points in the paint or at the rim that's a pretty tough formula to try to use to kind of go into the postseason against the best teams and consistently prove produce enough offense uh, and put enough pressure on the opposing defense with jump shots you know and so kind of on the surface i'm like yeah i don't think that's really a thing you know and i went back and kind of as i like to do after watching a team i'll go formulate a few hypotheses and go look at the numbers and like are they what i think they are from watching them and i was surprised to see that despite the fact that they really played very little rim protection, which you and I talked about after the Monday game. Um, they give up the eighth fewest points in the paint in the league. And so I went to kind of trying to work through, well, how do they do that? And we've seen you know, them play the Hawks twice this week. And both times the Hawks had to close with smaller lineups in both games. And I think, honestly, their version of rim protection is to make you go small and have you know basically a five out lineup and 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 say if you want to drive to the rim on og Anunoby and pascal siakam and scotty Barnes and the rest good luck you know and that sort of thing so it's when i kind of pressed in a little bit i was like well that's interesting to kind of kind of think is that workable um or not i now i i don't think they're a team that's going to kind of go and say if they got into the second round and really push a, a Milwaukee or you know who knows really what Philly's going to be you know with Daryl Morey in charge you know but a, a good say a good Philadelphia team or you know and those sorts of things um, I don't think that's there but it, it is interesting to think about a team saying uh, we're not going to put a room protector on the floor but we are going to put so much pressure on you with our offense our ball movement our five out our pace that we're going to chase your center off the floor and then you're not going to have anybody uh, the, 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 the personnel you typically rely on to generate that rim pressure and and that scoring at the rim so you know i don't think they're going anywhere this year but i think it, so i don't think this formula makes me feel like they're going to make a lot of noise but i i don't think there's I don't think it's as crazy as I thought it was, you know, say a few hours ago when I started kind of this thinking exercise. I think that they're closer to you know, being able to do something with this formula if they can just add, you know, the right supplementary pieces over the next year or two or whatever. But I, I still think they're probably too reliant on uh, jump shots. You know, their their leading score friends really can't score at the rim, really can't score inside. And, the, and the, if, if they had someone that they could play next to him, even if it was like their third guard, like a, an Eric Gordon type, or whatever, that can't, can really get in there, you know, and do things at the rim, that that would, that would make them more multidimensional. And so I, th- I think they're a piece or two away, but it's not like, uh, I think they're a little closer than, than maybe my, where I thought they were before I started this mental exercise. That's, that's where I came out. Yeah. I like what you said about, you know, Gary Trent and the, and the ball handling. I think that kind of, poses an issue in terms of you know what what they can create with Fred Van Vliet not really being somebody who scores in the paint uh, one of the things I'm interested in is just you know Nick Nurse and, and how he doles out his minutes like how how is that sustainable is he is he the new Tibbs and it, 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 is this is the, you know one of the things I've always wondered because it seems like it would kind of make sense is like you know when you when you do as much switching as a team like uh, you know, Toronto does, you know, does that sort of save your legs a little bit? You're not doing these cross court closeouts, trying to catch up to stuff. You kind of stay in your own little area and there, there are fewer, you know, dead sprints in the half court. It, it, does that save the legs a little bit? So my answer is that, uh, and it may be a frustrating answer, but it, it depends really. Like if I think back to the Mike D'Antoni Rockets teams that switched all the time, and really one of their key goals was to save James Harden's energy by not have him chasing someone all over the defensive half court, you know, on possessions and kind of keep him in one spot. Um, so it really depends on what your goal is. If your goal is um, that, then I think you can save energy. When I watch the Raptors play, I don't think they're really um, prioritizing that because they are really trying to jump passing lanes or trying to, 
kind of, uh, you know, rush ball handlers with a, a second uh, defender when they have a little bit of leverage on the ball handler and things like that. So they're really activated. Um, and so I, I, I don't think it's something they're doing. And I don't think it's something they probably would try to prioritize with their personnel because they're trying to create a ton of easy offense with their defense and, and really put a, I mean, they put as much ball pressure on your ball handlers, I think, as any team I've seen this year. And that that requires a lot of energy. Now, they, they do a lot of good stuff with it. And so I don't think they want to ramp that down. So for them, I think that's not a not a path to some minute sanity and some <laughs> workload sanity. Uh, maybe Masai has told Nick Nurse, hey, help is, you know, the trade deadlines are right around the corner. The buyout market's not too far past that. Help is on the way. So, you know, push the guys uh, right now. And, and, and I, I think Toronto is a, a team that maybe a month ago saw themselves as a team like hey we could buy or sell as we approach the deadline but we need to figure out what we are and one of maybe they felt like the only way to do that was to kind of take a group of seven seven and a half guys and really push them and see how that went across a decent stretch of the schedule and you know i, I think they're good enough to feel like they might want to do something you know this year if the opportunity is right there you and i talked about i think well, i can't remember if we talked about it on the pot or not about you know it, do they have an opportunity to send goran Drogic out to get something back that's helpful because it seems like Goran doesn't um, uh, seem excited about playing in Toronto for what, you know, whatever other situation or, or for whatever reason and stuff. And maybe that's about giving Fred Van Vliet all of the room he needs to have to kind of be in the role he's in. But I mean, they're, they're super, they're an interesting team, but uh, yeah, Nick Nurse, they cannot keep doing this. <laughs> the rest of the season. No, yeah. not even, yeah, not even okay. close. But I mean, I mean, I get why they do it, though, because I think that's honestly the biggest problem. If you try to look at them as a contender is that they just don't have a bench like there's just nothing right. there. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and if the Hawks, uh, you know, had had more stable second, you know, play the whole game tonight, they win that game because, because they have more depth. The Hawks use that depth to kind of stay in range, even though Toronto was having had what had to be one of their best shooting performances of the season because the Hawks were so deep, you know, the Hawks kind of made little runs and, 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 or just stay in, stayed in contact while Toronto was dealing with, you know, their key guys being off the court for, you know, stretches here and there. And that, that's one of the things I thought kept the Hawks in the game, but yeah. I mean, like when you listened, if you listen to Zach Lowe's podcast with Bobby Marks and Tim Bontemps, like, I don't, no one discussed the Raptors. Like it's all, of course, Philly and Simmons and Beal and the Wizards. And, you know, but I, for me, I look at a team like the, the Raptors and I'm like, what could they do that could not only make a difference this year, but beyond this year? They, they're a really fascinating team uh, for me. So. Yeah. I mean, they, they might be a year away, but they've, they've certainly got uh, some stuff there and, and they're, they're making their own model. They're not really. <laughs> following a whole lot of other people's blueprints sure. um it, it, one thing that I, that I wondered about from the hawk side but uh kind of going up against toronto is sort of late in the game you know the, the hawks get into a pretty good groove late with their small ball lineup and toronto's doing what they're doing with switching and such The Hawks were still setting a lot of screens for Trey and Toronto was just going to switch them and they're getting Trey on Scotty Barnes. And it's like, I don't know, to me, I, I think, I think I want to see Trey go up against Fred Van Vliet. Like why, why are we, why set the screen there to get that matchup with Trey on, you know, a, a, a big with length that, you know, is pretty mobile and can kind of get in his way. Like, I have all the respect in the world for Fred Van Vliet's defense, but he just doesn't occupy the same airspace as those other guys. It, it is interesting to watch that. It, it It's funny because when I find that tactic the most frustrating to watch is when they have a lead and they're bleeding, you know, 14, 15 seconds of shot clock, and then Trey is attacking in isolation with really no time to, you know, there's one time for one pass, you know, maybe in, in those scenarios. Tonight when you're watching that, I, I think what they're doing is, um, first of all, Trey, is, Trey likes attacking, quote, bigs. Now, there's 8 million different definitions of what a big is, and there's in the league, there's what, right. 150 different bigs, and all they all have their own style and talents or whatever. 
Um, but I think a part of that is getting the opposing big out of the paint because Trey is so lethal with the lob and, and creating some size advantage at the rim if the other team is going to run a second defender at him, if he has an opportunity to kind of deliver a pass to you know to a guy who has an undersized defender on him. So I think For it's sure. creating I think it's creating leverage, Trey attacking a big in concept, which goes goes fine, you know, and goes well a lot. But if if he's drawn out the big and they trap him and the ball moves that I think they like to use that leverage to generate the shot at the rim. Sure. Um, with the other teams, you know, typically the strongest interior defender uh, out of the way. So that's, that's what it, I feel like I'm watching. Yeah, that makes sense. It just seemed like, you know, there, there was a, I, I agree. And they certainly got a lot of those kinds of opportunities tonight. It just right. seemed like that, that, that this was also happening in a stretch where, Trey was trying to feel it out and he he was more likely to to be the one shooting in those instances and it just felt like they were kind of banging their head against the wall when for the first time the whole night they really weren't doing that right yeah, yeah. and and it was interesting to watch them close because that lineup in the shoot that the, the four threes they made in the row got them I think five was as close as they got it if I remember correctly I don't think they got it any I think so low, lower than that um, but then there were a couple of rebounds in the defensive and they couldn't quite, you know, gather when they needed right. to. And that just, that's what really kind of led to um, Toronto kind of putting the game away. And that's, that's the downside of, of having to put max shooting and max ball handling on the court in some cases is that you sacrifice something somewhere else and, you know, you've got a team rebound and, you know, I don't want to say like, well, the Hawks were tired, but they did play what I think was a pretty emotionally exhausting game last night going up against a team with the best record in the league. I think Phoenix is the best team in the league right now on, you know, national national broadcast and all that sort of stuff. And it took every ounce of, you know, exertion they had last night really to kind of finally close that game out, even with a, a pretty messy, you know, you know, stint there in the last minute and a half or whatever it was. So I, th- I think they were a little depleted coming in, but and I think it took them a little while to kind of find their legs. And then I thought both teams were playing with about the same amount of energy from Um, uh, there, uh, but I think this was Toronto's like what four and five nights. Or, four four and five nights. Stretched. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I don't think either team really can kind of claim the you know no. schedule no, loss I, or schedule result or whatever. So, yeah, I think less than the schedule. I you know you look in terms of you know the Hawks and what they have, and they 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 have such a nice variety of bigs. Uh, you know, t- tonight would have been an ideal game to have Danilo Gallinari. For sure. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think, you know, you know, any I, the schedule thing is a wash. You know, Hawks have had a tough schedule. Raptors have had a tough schedule. And I think that was kind of a big balance tilter, not having him, because I think this is this is the kind of game that you have him around for. He, he kind of, you know, can, can tilt some of the ma- uh, matchups when a team is trying to switch like that. How do you think JC looked tonight with that injury last night? Uh don't uh, you know i was trying to sort of watch it closely in the first half and it 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 seemed like maybe there were a couple finishes where he's kind of feeling his way and making sure but i think he kind of opened up in the second half i don't think there was a whole lot where he was pulling back or holding back i mean it's a a potentially scary kind of injury but you know he's i don't know he looked all right i guess yeah i thought like his first dunk he went about 50% maybe, you know, normally he just hammers it. And then I, I thought there's a couple of times when uh, he was shying away from contact and trying to get a feel for how am I really, you know, early in the game, sort of like you said. Uh, and then I, I, I thought his jump shot was affected for a while. Uh, and he looked like he was shooting with something that was tight or uncomfortable or distracting or whatever it was maybe even some combination of those things. But by, I felt like once we got to the third quarter, he looked like normal JC to me uh, at that point he was chasing block shots he was really trying to help at the rim and help rebound and maybe that's adrenaline and his competitive nature maybe he was hurting who knows he he probably won't tell us um you know fully uh and stuff but hopefully it's a good sign uh knock on wood because i'm still concerned about him but it's a um it's an area of the body where it's like it feels like 
is something starting to go i don't you know i don't want to speculate what it is but it's just where it is just, just makes me concerned like oh man i hope this is not something that's kind of a, a gradual uh you know thing that just gets a little bit worse uh every game every week or whatever it is so anyway knock on wood i just just curious what you saw there yeah is there anything else you want to hit on any, any thoughts of you know what you saw in the phoenix game i i just thought that was a great win uh i mean obviously you know it was one of their better shooting performances of the season but i mean phoenix you know was on a winning streak and phoenix really won that game and and i thought phoenix fought them hard and i thought every time that they were vulnerable with the basketball chris paul was all over it and the hawks really had to kind of find some composure and they did until the last minute and a half or whatever then they lost their minds and you know, so I just, I thought that was one of their toughest tougher games of the year. And when I think back to the game in Phoenix earlier in the year, how that finished with you know I put a <laughs> that clip of CP assaulting DeAndre Hunter on that game yeah, position, right? I, I just thought it took a lot of mental toughness and and just a lot of um, kind of connectedness in the, the team pulling in the same direction. And and, and so I, mean, I was encouraged not only with the result, but with how they achieved that result. Uh, I think the team seems like they're in a good place, you know, playing together, pulling together in, in the same direction. And I felt like I saw more of that tonight. And I feel like we're seeing that pretty consistently now where unlike a month ago or whatever, you know, amount of time back when it was, oh, geez, we're, you know, five minutes into the game and everybody looks like, you know, their shoulders are, you know, slouched and they're not looking at each other. They're not talking to each other. And they're, not, they're obviously not feeling confident about what's going on. Now when they hit adversity, they just, you know, push back, fight back, claw back, scratch back. Uh, and we saw that tonight to get the game back to five. You know, we hear NBA players say all the time, like, oh man, when you have to fight back, it's hard to have gas after you get back in contact. And I felt like that's kind of what we saw tonight with the rebound. They couldn't quite get and all that sort of stuff, but the fight is there. The competitive spirit is there. It looks like they're, they're playing together and working hard together, pulling in the same direction. And so, you know, they've created a real uphill battle for themselves. The, the schedule is going to run out a little bit more week by week. And it's, it's hard to know if they, what kind of shot they actually have to maybe uh, get ahead of the plan and get higher than the plan. Um, but you know, I'm, I continue to be encouraged with what I'm what I'm seeing. They they're winning games when Trey plays. Um, they almost got that win when Trey sat earlier in the week. So I I, I just I think still mostly like almost you know a pretty overwhelmingly positive stuff I'm seeing from them right now. Yeah, you know, if if the health holds up, it's it's, it's easy to be bullish on them. There was there I think there was one play where. Kevin Herter like did just like a basic crossover, not even really trying to get open or do a whole lot. I think it was just kind of a, a setup move and he just lost it for a backcourt violation. And like the next five minutes, he was just completely locked in. And it's like, that's, you know, fourth year Kevin Herter is different than second, second year Kevin Herter was two years ago. You could just kind of see the the steely determination of okay, no, this is not where it's going to go south. And you know, watching Phoenix in person, my goodness, they are <laughs> they so are weird. connected on defense. Like they oh, are, they are that you you know why they're a good team. They are on the ball. You know, they're they're making good decisions on defense, and they're they're big and physical. I mean, Jay Crowder is a large person, and you know he spends the whole game grinding on you and that's not necessarily my my favorite style from a marketing standpoint but it's you know if if you do it against him when he's doing that you you've done something because you know with with him and Aiton and Bridges you know he's super impressive guarding Trey I mean Trey had an unbelievable game but like that first quarter when he was going up against Bridges it was easy to start to think oh well maybe this is gonna go so well you know I I was kind of frustrated kind of the opposite of what 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 I was frustrated about tonight because Phoenix was uh because Toronto was switching and Phoenix wasn't but in that first quarter it's like uh you know with with Bridges I wanted I wanted the Hawks to, to to actually set a screen they're such notorious screen slippers right that you know it was just too easy for bridges to stay attached to trey and it, it felt like they were stifling trey's uh ability to to get things going and create by just not getting bridges off of him for a second i thought he just needed a few moments of 
you know, okay, Bridges is caught on the screen. I can get something going, going to the hoop now because he just kind of looked like a deer in the headlights for the first eight minutes of the game. And then after that, he was, he was on, but I just, I felt like the screen slipping was hurting them in that first quarter. Yeah. And then we have to remind, remember also that kind of like JC said tonight, Trey came in with an injury last night and was kind of feeling his way through the, the and what a horrible matchup for that, <laughs> you know? Um, but I mean, but it, with Phoenix too, it's like you, you watch them and guys that you almost forget about, like Cam Johnson, that dude is big. He is a large person. <laughs> and uh, and now they're playing Wayne Wright, um, you know, who's a, a guy who's, it's fun to watch those guys kind of find their footing in rotation. And, you know, I'm rooting for him. I, I love when, you know, guys kind of trying to really chip away and find a way in the league and stuff. But yeah, you're, I mean, the two nights in a row now back to back, like when Toronto was relentless ball pressure, Phoenix gives you that ball pressure, but a different kind of physicality to it as well. And then the, just the veteran presence of CP kind of, I mean, if you hear him communicate like nonstop on that, end of it, it's like he sees everything and, and, and processes everything. I, I put a clip on Twitter last night where when Trey gave the ball up to Bogey and got it back in that left corner and hit that three, as soon as Trey gave the ball up, you heard CP say, <laughs> stay with him, stay with him. Like he knew exactly what was going to happen and his teammates didn't quite process the information as fast, but he was trying to talk them through it and Trey got that three. And like that... In, in my mind, that's why I love basketball. That's why I love the NBA. And it's something you don't get when you watch, say, Major League Baseball. You know, it's something that is hard to get um, when you watch the NFL, even though there's a lot of communication and, you know, and things as well. When you, you got, you know, five on five with no helmets and, you know, and closer quarters than a football field. And, and you see someone like CP, like coaching that team through the whole game, just on, and th- to me, that is as, as good as sports gets, you know, and uh, you know, the Hawks lost tonight. I love watching this Raptors team and I'm fascinated with where they go. I think the Hawks are a rising team in the East, a rising power in the East. Absolutely. For sure. Um, and then, you know, to see them go up against what I think is the best team in the league last night, that was fun. And, you know, so we're getting to the point in the season where I think the, uh, the fun potential just keeps going up and up uh and you know i know a lot of people are excited about the trade deadline and you know that's interesting obviously and stuff and from a team building perspective but there's nothing like watching these teams when the uh the, the leverage of where they are in the season and the schedule and the things that are on the line go higher and, and you see these teams kind of respond and, and go at each other it's great stuff it's been a fun week of basketball i agree all right well Here's to another good week, and I appreciate you taking the time to join me tonight. My pleasure as always, Kevin. Have a good night. And you.